Thank you for listening to True Crime 49. Season 3, Women Hunted, traces the progression of Robert Hansen, an Alaskan serial killer known as the Butcher Baker. Listener discretion is advised. What makes a serial killer? Is it nature versus nurture? Was it their overbearing mother or father? In their DNA? Or a chemical lacking in their brain? Our budding serial killer story starts with Susie and a lineage of Danes. Welcome to True Crime 49. Inside the glowing wheatgrass at sunbreak and the fabled lay in the land of the milk and honey. Someone's strong sons are tending to the animals in the fields. Their stout daughters are separating the butters from the cream in the vats. The wool garments they are wearing are exquisite. Some man eating a wonderful porridge of grains and barleys never knowing that down in the bowl and down inside the man now is the strontium. He didn't shave with the blade that morning. His stubbles were tiny clean prickles and they were still there. And they are still here now when they pulled him out of the bog mud. Black skin turned to acid leather in the tar water. Probably over a hundred years. So that now he was ready to lay there perfectly preserved in the bog for the rest of the 2,300 years. The last moments of our colors, already pale and blue blotching, still warmed the mouth breath as his grim sneer filled with the black water. Creeping below, his eyes seemed in comfort as they went under. And the eardrums never burst in the strangled knot still around his neck, but thrown over his back, laying at rest with him now. The last open air trapped in a bubble, the bog becomes a ringing in his eardrum. The world outside muffled in the close black water. The eardrum still working with no one listening for a long, long time. Until at least when the Romans ventured all the way up to the ocean, finding the old, old lands and the fields, they made deals with the strong people. They were envious of their woolen wear. The powerful politicians elect Roman officers. The pay was exclusive. When the lands were fragmented, Sweden and Germany, the shirt and the trouser leg of the old empire, each grabbing a tit for themselves, and each tit becoming Denmark and the other Belgian. All that spilt milk on the ground over all those warm, thick honeys. Don't be so coy, the fields are still there, and you've had of them. Warm eyelids are heavy, already remembering your Belgian waffles with whipped cream and the Danish. You think that's all they made? A 4th century man known as Tulland Man is so well preserved you can see the creases in his forehead. A simple rope around his neck indicates a hanging and the serene look on his face tells of a peaceful transition. Early texts from this region note men hanging deceased throughout the country. These men can be assumed to be thieves or killers. However, our Dane died by hanging one winter's day or early spring, perhaps as a sacrifice to end the winter or to give thanks. He showed no violence on his body, and shortly after the hanging, he was cut down. They closed his eyes and placed him in the bog where he remained for centuries. Scholars have studied Tolan Man since he was first discovered in 1950. The motive for his death is speculative and still unknown. In 2017, somewhere in their halls of justice, there were papers that were filed. Every ink dot wetened, then dried, as the pleading process was painstakingly clicked off one by one until eventually, per the law of the day, euthanasia 
was granted for a patient who'd made their case like a patriot to the end, gritting. Death finally granted the promise of the fear of becoming the wretched creature in their nightmares. To take control of the years-long car accident, forgetting to have to watch it, pieces flying off in slow motion. As the methods were administered, the death's black waters filled the still warm mouth breath, and the eyes looked comforted in mercy to finally be free. Never having to see the sun break again, it was a nightmare over and over again. Wide awake with the world to himself out here, dressed in pressed crease baker's whites. The only thing is, when he wears it, sometimes instead of looking like a baker, or some type of clergy. On him, the white pants and shirt, he sometimes looks like an intern at the nervous hospital. Be polite and don't stare, damn it. He's skinny as a rail and his acting's atrocious. The poor devil stutters at times, God bless him. The eyes go under into blackness. A quasi-medical procedure, and the time on the wall is documented. The interns cleaning up after so many sad stories, the cancers and dementias, sometimes both. There were reporters on this one, though. Moving the paper's edge in the way on the counter to read the diagnosis. To tell the girls later over strong tea and Vienna breads. Vienna prods, maybe. Later, over the buttery cream slathered Vienna breads, she can't believe her fucking eyes. On the paper, in the wizard's old writing, the diagnosis says infantile personality disorder. Those mysterious dots over the O's and the dashes over the A's. They just killed someone for how they believe in the eternal. Seeing that they are merely a correction being needed. They had pleaded in their wicked tongue. I can't do it. Please don't make me become what I know I will. My skin is turning black and I'm becoming pickled to my heart. Souring like cabbage. Do not let my eyes alive slip down to the wet blackness. And I guess we should applaud them. They look so cultured. I love those colors. Is that wool? As the Vienna broads crumble from your mouth, damn, they're so good. The trick is to have trays of donuts with a good selection of each. When Miss orders from the donuts, she points at the tray. But the baker decides which one of the many to slip into her box. It's a sweetheart deal. Although not as progressive as the Dutch, Denmark allows for patients to refuse care in dire situations. In the Netherlands, they have taken it much further and allow people with mental disorders, including borderline personality disorder, to end their lives. The sun technically set at 3.23 that afternoon, and it is pitch black outside by now. The young lady needs to go pee, and she is part running and skip slides a little rounding the corner in the darkened hallway in the real estate office she'd recently started working at. Her co-worker chided her, hurry up. They'd already flicked the lights down, closing up when she'd remembered. The older man chuckled a little. She was like his daughter. Damn there could be in this light. She rounded the corner to the back room. She tried not to laugh a little. And she made it. The slight stinging hot but such a relief there, there's no way in hell she would have made it home that night. Her undergarments are similar to the style of the ones they sold at Sears and Roebuck in the catalog about a year and a half ago. The one guy had started all the cars to warm up the heaters, blowing frigid skeleton fingers at first as he shuffled from car to car, peeking out the window as the motors come into operating temperature. From the slits in the dash, the fingers arise warming to the touch across the underside of her smooth glass. Until it is steaming in the darkness now, 
warming the water from ice intermittently sliding down her windshield. When she climbed into the car seat and waved through the pearl-smeared windows, the wiper giving that first rebellious screech scratching, sliding off part frozen jelly bean splatter from early on the road and what had fallen sticking. Obscured co-workers giving the kid a nod and a wave, the radio programming, as they said, crackled vinyl on the latest recording of the Doors. It was the only one in the state, they said, the chart topper. She turns the dial up, the album was Stone Fox. Rolling to a red light, she comes to a stop as a blurry car pulls up next to her. She tries to pinch the elastic that must have rolled on her belt line, it dug into her skin. The seatbelt came tight on her neck, and she pushed a little harder. And when she looked up, the driver next to her was staring at her. When her eyes met with his, he must have thought she was beautiful. He looked like the perfect dork. She smiled to break the gaze, and he smiled too, maybe clearing his throat and his eyes coming back into the real world. The glassy jelly bean still around the wind glass becomes green in the traffic light, lurching on toward home. The Northern Lights Boulevard cast in music crackling over the sound waves. In 1971, Anchorage, Alaska, Susan, known as Susie, was just getting started in life. A steady, respectable job and a great apartment with roommates to share responsibilities and time with. She was 18 years old in November of 1971. Every move having become deliberate, because the outside world is still flowing out there, becoming weird when left unattended. To touch, our senses are like the facets of a cut diamond. Each tiny plane of perfect light is nothing really but a flake without the shape of all the others and all the stuff down below it. The eyes are blind in the dark, grateful to ears can see even through nothing. Our smell though, one whiff, and the memory turban kicks out a flush of moments almost in what the French would call the little death. Upon the heart they glitter down, begins to race the pounding. The throat sprinkled, gulps loudly, and the blink hard is a momentary annoyance. The fingers already pushing back the glass frames. The sniff of the nose was just a distraction for the glasses. From the old days, the pupil is expanding and darting, even the hair follicles standing up. A remnant from back when we must have really had more of the hair suit. All of that on those tiny little carts. The squeak stop of the handle lever coming out of the shower. The young woman does her routine and the opening fragrance of the shampoo and the conditioner gives soap essence, rising on the small warm thermals into the cooler rooms, like a flower opening around her. She's loosely clothed and dampening her hair. Slipping instantly like an eel back into his slit in the mud. Eyes looking at you often slipping below the surface completely. The fragrance of her bathwater blowing around the apartment door had conjures visions in his mind that are clawing themselves into the present tense. The thought of her damp hair and the water running flat down the curve from her belly button. He jolts to speak without talking. To the ear holes in her skull, she is puzzled, rising from the couch by the knock at the door. There is this guy. The guy from the stoplight, maybe. He says that he's looking for someone at these apartments, the name he has, but I guess she's right. But can you take a peek at her phone book? Letting the pages cascade the <clears throat> it must be unlisted. And then, man, you sure are beautiful. It was the guy from the stoplight. I have a fiancé. I'm engaged, she says. She gives him a shucks with the sad clown eyebrows. Yeah, right, she must have thought. 
closing the door surely on him. Walking from the lamplight, his legs part wading in the waves of shame, mocking and ridicule. The waves had begun to wash the monster's shins down to the bone. And his knee is like a knot end of a giant party sub sandwich, a strange example of the layers that were inside. And here he is now, scuffling in the dark back to the blurry car, the tiniest sliver of a winter moon fading to nothing soon. Five days later, the moon having blackened out completely two days ago, but here it is again, the tiniest of slivers, growing in strength again, new. Five in the morning, driving her roommate to work is a favor, not her favorite thing to do, but it's part of her routine now. The heater finally coming hot, swinging the wheel, just pulling back in, she saw a man step behind the corner. He had an orange hunter hat on. The keys jingling rattled from the ignition. The frigid cold air swirls in the port door as her feet hit the stamped ice parking lot. She's pivoting to dash into the warm apartment. A puff of steam, the pistol makes cross eyes for a minute. It registers in her mind like slow black tar. Shut up, he part gritted his teeth. The spittle from his stutter slur flicking onto her blouse button from his sex growl. Then the pompadour sneer in slow motion his mouth somehow, like a deformed penis tip, slick and slippery. Licking his lips or I'll blow your head off. The fires in his eyes. He is gloating in her fear, locked up like a lamb he thinks. He could almost feel his fingers snatching upon those tiny curls. And she will be like putty in his... She screams into the blackness, the blood-curling pitch, the last part feeling so good. The outside corner of her eyes flashing a fuck you. She saw things happening inside his eyes, then he mustered the click of the revolver hammer. Scream again. And I'll blow your... He began to stutter violently before he got hold of it. Blow your head off. The universe was in between them now. And there were waves washing around her calves and knees. The sight of her shins standing straight. In the reflection she catches it a vision. Of her ankles stretched with cheap hunter's rope pulled apart to a stinging touch. When the voice of her roommate, across the universe, part out of the door yelling her name, eyes vying for an angle of what is going on over there, looking at the man. Susie, are you all right? He has turned away. The waves shatter to nothing in a gasp pop. The chill moving through her how it moves through itself. The cellophane bag of death ripped off her now. She feels like she's underwater. And he's almost rounding the corner now, like a deep diver, pulling himself up out into his tiny dinghy. She sees his ass and his legs slither out of her world again. The cold coming in curls around her. Her hands are shaking. She's breaking the plane of the apartment door. Fight or flight is a common term for dealing with trauma. However, there are many different responses, including freeze, appease. Many perpetrators are counting on their victims to freeze in shock or become accommodating, willing to do whatever it takes to survive. Our young Susie may not have survived her encounter had her roommate not taken heed to the phrase, see something, do something, and screamed into the darkness. Even the samurais might be jealous if they got to peek through the jaded eyes of the street cops. Down on 4th Avenue, 1971. Half-heartedly, they take a look for this guy with an orange hat and a big pistol. 
The descriptions come over the speaker from a piece of equipment that we would know later as a plastic walkie-talkie, but back then it cost as much as the car did, and it was giving the man's description when they saw him wandering in the dark to grandmother's house. He turns, squinting into the blinding light and the cold as he blinked hard and pushed his glasses up. His arms hung uneven and he looked pitiful, the poor thing. No gun and hat though. They rolled up on him and do the thing. The one cop is asking the questions and the other cop can hear them chuckle a little on the other side of the fence as he's poking around in some footprints that lead in a straight line somewhere over there in the darkness towards the pretty girl's apartment. And there it is. The hat in the snow tossed in the brush, the headband appears already rigid, frozen stiff from a gushing sweat. And then there was the pistol. Must have been warm when it went into the powder. The skin of the steel near the handle is salted in sugar snow. The liquid becomes shatter. These are things they told her, or she learned of them leading up to the courtroom. The final healing closure of this thing, counting down to the moment she would have to walk up the witness stand. At first when she thought of it, it was like an explosion that blows you off the edge of the cliff. Still in the real world though, her eyes would startle at the most unexpected of things. And it was the fucking dreams that could do her in. Thoughts were so slippery they slither. She gasps of air back into the real world. A thousand yard stare awash in her memory, a tear finding down upon a grit tooth corner. The one detective was eating a sandwich while the other was explaining to the new kid that it's never as good as you imagined it. He looked at the other guy. His eyes were blank like a gorilla, his jaw politely chewing. Gorilla Cow raises his eyebrows at something invisible in the room and the kid looked skeptical when a commotion broke out in the hallway. It's the district attorney. It's in moments they're glad handing each other and the district attorney has his hand on the boss's back. The boss is smiling and nodding along. He looks back at the one detective and the wild-eyed kid. The boss's eyes are tinged with the frantic look of what the fuck is going on? Searching the small crowd for someone clever to somehow throw him a fucking bone. He's dying out there. The nest from upstairs has been disturbed. A bigger bird has tuddled down the stairwell. His breath feathers fresh patted down, but he saved the cough and the fist for just before he came out of the stairwell door. Eventually, with laugh tears still dabbing, the boss saunters into the doorframe and hangs against it, as if he needs a break from the party. We did it, guys. We got a conviction. Good job. Hard work pays off. A conviction, the one guy asks. A plea deal, actually, but the detective's lips are hanging down like a bee has stung them with venom of disbelief. You mean the guy that almost snatched that pretty girl? The I'll blow your head off guy. The boss's eyes are scanning the fish scales in his mind. And the kid blurts out, the guy who, he doesn't say the next words but open his mouth, lurches forward urging someone to say it. The entourage is beginning to go up the stairwell. And the boss is distracted to the pitch of the dog whistle whining in his ears. Serious, good job, case closed. He gives the thumbs up, there's just too much to say. And he is going up the stairwell as the dinger lamp glows. The elevator doors must be opening upstairs by now. The kid looks at the one with the bee sting lips absorbing the venom. He looks at the guy with the sandwich. The man in the orange hat was out on bail for what he did to Susie, his first known victim, and was able to spend Christmas a free man. He would get a pretty sweet deal spending the nominal amount of time in Seward. While some law enforcement were starting to recognize a dangerous man, the DA in particular felt stalking a girl, threatening her verbally, and sticking a gun in her face was not that big of a deal. The slap on the wrist would be a cakewalk for this evolving killer, especially if he went in with a few fresh memories. 
the healing closure of this thing. In that letter saying that it was finally time, it never came. The prolonged silence revealing another voice, and it is there now, walking down the street with her, at her mother's house, crouched close speaking to her freely at the most unexpected of moments. Thank you for listening to TC49. You can find us online on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Join our Patreon for extra content and visit our website for shirts, mugs, and stickers. See show notes for sources and links.